We are really excited and delighted to have Dr. Haynes from HealthCore to talk about health plan resource networks. But before I introduce him, let me mention some housekeeping uh, issues. So as you know, for CME credit, you must sign in and you must include your email and credentials. Please do not miss our February 1st Tech Talk with Paul Colm, who is coming back from MedStar and is going to talk about longitudinal data analysis. Also, uh, please note the January 20, uh, not 26, because it's today, I guess next week, 29th, we'll have, oh, 26, sorry, I'm confused. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so not our January 26 ID series, uh, we'll have our sp a special guest, Dr. Megan Lanefall, who is coming from University of Pennsylvania, uh, the School of Medicine, to speak on implementation science comes to surgery assessing and standardizing post-operative handoffs in the Christian care health system. So please, please register to help us to prepare. So as always, the full schedule is posted on our website, deCTR.org. And finally, do not forget, the registration is now open for the Axel Community Resource Exchange uh, on March 12th uh, of this year. The keynote speaker for the event is Dr. Georgia Dunstan, who is a founding director of the National Human Genome Center based out of Howard University. And she is an accomplished speaker on health disparities and genomic research. So do not forget to register. This is really, really exciting. So Dr. Heinz, we are really uh, honored to have you here. Uh, Dr. Heinz is currently the president and director of the clinical epidemiology uh, at HealthCore, and is also the data core lead for the FDA Mini Sentinel Distributed Database, and we'd love to learn more about that. And as uh, many of you probably know, HealthCore is an early owned sub subsidiary of ANSEM. Uh, Dr. Haynes is also adjunct assistant professor of epidemiology at uh, University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. He has a doctorate in pharmacy from Ohio Northern University and a master's of science in clinical epidemiology from University of Pennsylvania. Prior to working at HealthCore, he was senior research investigator in the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, also at uh, University of Pennsylvania. He is a very prolific author with a long list of peer review publications, and is also very importantly principal investigator on two PCORI grants regarding uh, data and PCORNet. So we are very excited to have you here. Thank you. I'll start. I'm, I'm not the president of Health Corps, although that would be a, a, a promotion uh, for sure. Um, so I'm a clinical pharmacist by training and a clinical epidemiologist. So together, I'm a pharmacoepidemiologist. Uh, that sounds like a narrow field at the Thanksgiving table, but it's really not. Um, one minute I'm on a call with oncologists, next minute di diabetologists, next minute cardiova cardiovascular folks, all over the map. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about some of that, that interest as it threads through and harmonizes with, with some of the activities with PCORnet. Um, so I, I am an employee of HealthCore, which is a subsidiary of Anthem. Uh, we'll talk about Anthem in the, in the introductions uh, of, of the talk. Um, HealthCore does receive funding from life science companies, but I'm, because of all my FDA work, kind of firewalled off from a lot of the life science stuff. So, uh, and my funding predominantly comes from PCORI. Uh, and the FDA. So if, if you came expecting a lot of data and numbers, I probably only have about four or five slides of data and numbers. It's a little bit more of, a, of an infrastructure type overview and how to make uh, research and the conduct of research uh, more efficient, but we do have a, a couple of uh, embedded specific examples. Uh, I'm going to do a, a health core anthem overview just to sort of set the stage of, of, of my background and the, the data background that, that we sort of bring to the table. Um, and it's more than just data, because it's the expertise around uh, that data. Although I will start off with a PCORnet overview slide just to kick things off. We'll do a deeper dive into PCORnet as an overview, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the demonstration projects that are ongoing within PCORnet, of which um, we at HealthCore uh, Anthem are, are participating in. Uh, and then I'll end with, with sort of where things are going with uh, the, the spinoff of this People-Centered Research Foundation, which is sort of phase two. Uh, of all of this. Um, 
So do we have folks, I know from the invite that there were some Nemours people. Do we have any Nemours people? Because they're actually part of PedsNet, which we'll talk about uh, a, a little bit uh, today uh, more specifically as well. So PCORI is funded, as you know, by the Affordable Care Act. And part of the authorizing legislation said you got to create this, this infrastructure, this network of networks. Uh, and they, they coined the term PCORnet. Um, so drop the I, add a net, and, and, and the acronym is essentially the same as PCORI. Um, and it's really focused on a, a infrastructure to be more efficient at the development of clinical trials and, and observational studies. When it was founded, it, it, it was founded with sort of two broad domains of networks, people or patient-powered research networks and clinical data research networks. Um, we were a little bit later to the game, but, uh, but got in to, to also showcase the value of health plan data uh, to close the gaps uh, that, that we'll be talking about today. So with that, I want to just give a, a little high-level overview of Health Corps, who we are, what we are, and, and what we do. This is a quote from um, our executive vice president that Health Corps uh, ties up into. So this is the boss's boss's boss, if you will. Uh, he said at, a, at an informatics uh, conference a couple months ago uh, this quote, and, and, and I, I really like it because I think it dovetails into the into the PCORnet space uh, really well. And so, you know, payers probably have the most complete data set, right? Because we have this, everybody has in their wallet uh, probably a insurance card of, of some type, right? And if I were to have a heart attack here in front of you today and have to go to the ED, they will grab this out of my wallet, they will make a photocopy of it, right? Because the ED wants to get paid, right? So this becomes this, this ability to sort of track me, right? And what's really strong with uh, health plan data and what makes it complete in theory is that you guys like to get paid and we like to know who we're paying and I can go to many different health systems and I have a defined enrollment and a defined end of enrollment, which is really good for population health, right? Um, you won't know if I come down here healthy and move to the area. I won't be sort of part of Christiana until I get sick or need a well, well visit. And so it's really hard to get that, what is my underlying population until I show up inside your door. Doctors and health systems have really acute data. You've got great data on vancomycin 1 gram Q12 on 5 cell. I don't have that, right? Do you have really acute data, blood pressure data, that uh, much closer to the patient than a health plan does? Um, but it's not complete, as we just talked about, with the fragmentation of healthcare across health systems. And then patients have the most relevant data, but it's not actionable. These things, the, the Fitbits, the phones, uh, the devices, the logs, the little crib sheets of, of what drugs I actually took today, all of that is very important and relevant data, but it's not actionable because it's not in our environment either to do research or let alone provide some, uh, some gap closing in, in care. All right, so Anthem, um, you'll see big numbers and then they get really small, right? So 71 million individuals served, but that's, because also there's some Medicaid plans that are included that we can't do research on. Um, so this is a big uh, insurance uh, provider operating uh, health plans in, in, in 14 states um, with a whole host of uh, subsidiaries, and there could probably be an hour-long talk on just what is Anthem. What is Health Corps is we have, uh, as a subsidiary, we have access to that data. We call it the HERD, or the Health Corps Integrated Research Database. And we, we sort of expand that database into an environment. And because that environment really has access to members and patient communities, right? Because we can survey our members because it's fully identifiable. Uh, unlike a database um, that might be de-identified, like uh, some of the other observational databases that are out there, Truven or IMS, where you can't go back and do medical record validations with providers or engage providers about, uh, about the care that, that, that's being provided. And then Health Corps really has this, this, this ball here in the middle uh, of clinical and scientific expertise. So the company was founded by uh, two PharmDs uh, back in 1995 and, and really started as, a, uh, as, as more of a contract research organization, but saw the value in uh, the integration of claims data uh, to, to help showcase the, the longitudinal follow-up uh, of patients to, uh, to close gaps in data. So if anybody's worked with Medicaid data or Medicare data, the data structure is going to be very similar, right? Administrative claims data, uh, 
you know, has the, the, the classic enrollment type uh, uh, fields, and then also has prescription claims and facility and um, provider claims. Um, one of the nice strengths of the health core data is we also have access to lab data, um, which sort of goes beyond some of the Medicaid, Medicare type data environments where you might know a test was ordered but not have the result. But even this is incomplete. Um, I don't even know if, I'm never sure if I'm allowed to say where we get our lab data, but it's the two white buckets that sit outside of almost every doctor's office in the country. Uh, <laughs> probably around here, there's like a green Christiana bucket in between those two white buckets, but you're with me. <laughs> so do we have complete lab data? No. Do you have complete lab data? No. We got to get together. <laughs> Health systems and, and payers have to get together. Um, so already the numbers are smaller than, than where I started. Um, 62 million that are that are sort of in researchable uh, 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 plans with medical eligibility. Uh, this slide actually needs to be updated because we actually have a lot more pharmacy data now. Um, but the ph medical and pharmacy, being a pharmacoepidemiologist, is where it's all at for me, right? Being able to to capture both exposure uh, and outcome. One of the limitations of claims data right off the bat is follow-up time, right? People change jobs, open enrollment hits, the employer decides to go with a different health plan completely. Very, very fragmented. So I'll pause for a question. What is the most understudied observational population in America today? Not uninsured. Uninsured could be observationally studied in type of data uh, environments as well. The six, my mom's in it. She turned 65 on Monday. 65 to 65 and a half year old are not followed observationally in America today, right? Academics go out by, by Medicare data. You need the first six months of baseline data to figure out, oh, you already had breast cancer. Oh, you already had this. You already had that, right? We track along with our data. We hit 65. We flush all that claims data down the toilet. And we become a new member in Medicare, now followed for the rest of life. It's so fragmented in our ability to identify and longitudinally follow patients. Um, so we'll get into that. So I showed you earlier a, a, a map of the United States of where our specific health plans were. I want to make the point that we're not just operating in those, in, those, in those specific states. So for example, and I do not know this to be true, so I always use this as my example, Abercrombie and Finch is located in Ohio. They may offer the, all their employees Anthem of Ohio insurance, right? But the shirtless guy down there at the Christiana Mall, he's got Ohio of Anthem insurance, but he lives in Delaware. So that's why we have people in Delaware. That makes sense. But we don't have a lot of people in Delaware. Our biggest markets are in the states where uh, we offer health plans. Right? And that's a little bit different as a, as a blue compared to sort of Aetna and United and Humana that are a little bit more uh, nationwide. All right, so here's one of the data slides, so uh, get ready for some data. Um, this is how our data compares to the age distribution in the United States, and I've, I've already made my point about 65, and you can see the steep drop off at 65. We do have Medicare Advantage plans, and that Med Advantage data is not in the, the ResDAC or the research data that you can get from Medicare. So we do have some over 65. You can see the area under the curve for the working population is greater than the United States, as indicative of those who have uh, commercial health insurance. And we're a little bit lower in the, in the under five category uh, due to CHIP. Um, and, and hopefully that remains that way. Um, so that was sort of the broad sweep stroke of, of health core. I'll, I'll pause for any major questions around what the data is. OK. So PCORnet, and so PCORnet is what if we can do research differently? What if instead of uh, spending $30 million on one project, we can spend $3 million on 10 projects? And I think that that's been sort of the, the genesis of the, of, the, of, the, of the building the infrastructure to address uh, some of these needs, that, that research is currently not addressing the questions that matter most to people. So a big focus on engaging um, patients and people into the into the design and the conduct of the research and a, and a variety of stakeholders, improving the efficiency uh, because research is often too slow. If I were to go to uh, 300 sites across the country and say, tell me how many patients have COPD, I got to pay everybody's informatics shop to run around and write code to figure out how many people have COPD. 
Whereas if data is in what we'll talk about, a common data model, I might be able to write code centrally and distribute it out. Uh, and so obviously time is money, so I think too slow and too expensive sort of uh, go hand in hand. And so, um, we, you know, we all know in this country and in this room how much uh, there is for a need to close the, the gap in, in evidence. Uh, and I, I think, and the, the focus of today's talk is really going to be on the need to close the, da the data gap uh, to help improve uh, our efficiencies at answering those uh, evidence questions. And then ultimately, we need to get to closing gaps in care. So this PCORnet vision is really focused on large-scale clinical research uh, to enhance quality and efficiency, and the, and the mission is really driven in that, in that ability to inform healthcare uh, uh, stakeholders across a variety of, of, of practice settings. So uh, both the health plans, the health systems, uh, the patients, the practicing providers, um, and et, et cetera, policymakers, uh, et cetera, about how to uh, improve the conduct of research, the value of that research uh, into our sort of clinical ecosystem. So what is PCORnet? And so PCORnet embodies this network of network approach. And um, so it's, it's made up of, of 20 patient-powered research networks. Uh, these are really driven by um, patient communities, uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, and, and I have examples on, on the next slide of, of the 20 patient-powered research networks that really um, really have a body of questions that, that need to be addressed and also are much closer uh, to being able to collect patient-reported outcomes and support the design of the, the, the things that need to be done in, in, in patient data collection. There are 13 clinical data research networks uh, I hinted at one earlier called uh, PEDSnet, of which Nemours is part of. These are really uh, collections of health systems that have uh, uh, data that can be structured uh, in such a way to conduct routine uh, uh, querying. That's from a data perspective, but they also have the expertise and the questions that need to be addressed from frontline medicine, from that provider stakeholder, and from that health system uh, stakeholder. And then health plan research networks, of which there are two, HealthCore with Anthem is one, Humana uh, is the other health plan that's been funded to, to really showcase the, that, both that stakeholder perspective as well as that data perspective. And there's one coordinating center, although it's split out over three organizations. So I think we're all familiar with how, how things are one, but really fragmented across three, three groups. So, um, a lot of this work is led out of uh, the Duke Clinical Research Institute and uh, Harvard Pilgrim uh, Healthcare. Uh, it's not by accident that Harvard is also the site where the FDA uses as a coordinating center for the Sentinel activities, uh, of which um, Sentinel is really a, a uh, we've been part of Sentinel since the beginning, and it, it, it's a collection of health plans that have their data in a common data model at the ready to address public health questions that come out of the FDA. So we'll get queries from the FDA that go and get uh, packaged into SAS programs uh, that are then distributed across 18 partners. For us to run, we have like five business days to run these. And the aggregate level data gets returned to Harvard to be packaged back up into reports um, for the FDA. And then the Genetic Alliance really um, focuses in on the, the patient uh, voice within the, the PCORnet. So these are the PPRNs. Um, they range from the About Network, which has uh, uh, breast and hereditary cancer, uh, arthritis power, has a, arthropodies. Um, if you look close enough, there's actually two Crohn's and colitis uh, uh, organizations. There's the adult Crohn's and colitis with CCFA, and Improved Care Now is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in a pediatric population, um, MS, muscular dystrophy, so you have rare diseases, uh, eHeart, you have very common. Uh, diseases with, with cardiovascular uh, conditions. A um, lot of different organizations that have a lot of different experience and exposure to, to diverse patient groups as well as uh, disease state. These are the CDRNs, and again, don't think of these as just one site. These are all made up of multiple sites. Uh, so, for example, New York City CDRN is about uh, eight organizations, NYU, um, uh, both New York Presbyterian uh, campuses, uh, Mount Sinai, Montefiore. Uh, PEDSnet is the Nemours, CHOP, um, 
nationwide, Cincinnati, uh, et cetera. Um, these are really big networks. Uh, and so when it's, it becomes a little bit of a telephone game, and that's what's so structured about Picornet is the queries get distributed uh, to these data sites that then often then have to distribute those, those queries out. Um, one of the strengths of Picornet, like the Sentinel world, was that data can remain where it was generated. Two strengths to that. One, where it was generated, they have the most expertise about that data. And two, privacy preserving uh, uh, space. So that only aggregate level data or, um, or de-identified data if individual data is, is required and, and, and then through complicated data use agreement. So I feel like I have an honorary JD and MBA after having <laughs> gone through some of the, the contracting work. There are two um, health plan research networks. I, I opened with those. Um, Humana is very similar to us. They have a, a, a subsidiary embedded inside them called Comprehensive Health Insights. And I actually have a, he also has a PharmD. I have like a PharmD counterpart over at Humana. One of the strengths of Humana is a, a very big med advantage population. Um, so, so that's a, a strength to, to their group. So I mentioned, you know, it's really more than just the data. And I, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the data, but I wanted to make sure I pause and say that it is more about the more than just the data, the patients from PPRNs and clinical data research networks, the researchers across these organizations coming together collaboratively, the clinicians that, that, that know some of the needs for evidence um, uh, on the front lines of, of medicine, and then health systems. Um, but we're going to spend the rest of the time sort of talking about the data and, and sort of why there's this underpinning to have a, a, a common data model approach. So if you've seen one epic installation, you've seen one epic installation, all right? So EMR data is messy. Claims data is, is, is messy, uh, although in theory it's cleaner because of the, the sort of treatment payment operation piece. And so it needs to be stru highly structured. And so um, that, that's really good for, for, for us and for research. But we have these disparate sites that might I might call it... Uh, you know, this type of visit, or you might call it that type of visit. Well, we got to harmonize into some common common buckets. What's the strength of Picornet over some other data models is, is, is an attempt to leave the data um, as close to how it was collected as possible. So in other words, it was this ICD-9 or this CPT code. Leave that. Standardize the name of the column so that I can push code out. Um, but don't map things too deeply into like the OMA model that maps a lot into sort of SNOMED or, or RX norm and those types of things where then you have to make a lot of decisions up front and it takes a long time to build the infrastructure. Um, this was uh, hopefully designed or in theory designed to be a lighter touch on the, on the up front, but then it does require a little bit more investigative work on, on the back end when, when things aren't exactly as, as you would anticipate. So how does PCORnet work? So I already mentioned that the data sort of stays with the with the data partner or with the and, and we don't like that term because it just it sounds like we're just partners for data. Um, but really, with the, the the partner organization that both has the expertise in the data as well as the data. Um, and so how how PCORnet envisions itself and this front door is open for business. I'll have the link later in the talk. Is a requester would submit the query to the front door. That front door is really um, the, the coordinating center that, that would, would, would recognize the query and request and understand, can PCORnet answer that question? And, and can we formulate a query uh, that, that, that could be responded to by our, by our partners? And then they distribute that query uh, across uh, CDRNs, and then CDRNs can run that query and return aggregate results and if you were trying to do a, a pragmatic study and I needed all of the people who had some rare disease, this would be an effective way of identifying uh, potential sites that you would then maybe want to work with or partner with. So a lot of preparatory to research work um, uh, is, is the main focus for right now, but also with funding, being able to use PCORnet um, uh, for, a full, for a full project. All right, so the question always is then, how big are you? Um, and so, you know, you have a, a, a breakdown that, that really matches and mirrors what, what you would see 
in the United States. And so I don't even think health plans are represented in here because we would add another 60 million to this. But now we're starting to double count. Um, so I want to make sure that whenever you see a number coming out of a PCORnet space, there's definitely the potential for double counting, right? Um, especially even within PEDSnet, right? Uh, and we'll talk about that in a slide in a minute with my with my boys as an example. But you only have to go up the road here and see uh, Chad's Ford, right? Chop and Nemours across the street from one another. They're, they they would be two different data points. Um, one of the strengths of health plan data is while we know that there is overlap, there's not overlap at any single point in time, right? You you should not have Aetna and Anthem at the same time. Um, if you do, it's Fraud. It's, you know, every year I fill out a form that says, I am not covered by any other insurance because I'm actually on my wife's plan at Penn because it's a far better plan. Health, health insurers know how to play the game. So, um, and health systems know how to work the game to, to get uh, good, good health insurance. So. Um, so lots of conditions, right? This is just to showcase big numbers. And, and, and if we added our numbers on top of these, it would be like, wait a minute. You have 300 million people in the database. That's like the entire United States. You're going to get there if you start adding up uh, uh, data points. Um, there is lab data uh, in in there, and, and lab data is messy. But uh, you know, hopefully, with with large data, some of the noise can get a little bit cleaned out. I've spent a lot of time cleaning lab data. It's not exactly fun. So. Think of all the different ways that PCORnet can be leveraged, right? Both its data, both its uh, researchers, clinicians, the, the, the patient voice into things. And so um, uh, requests can, can come from within networks, can come from outside of networks. These generate uh, uh, network collaboration requests, cross, cross collaborations, either uh, across data marts within a network or uh, across networks within PCORnet. Um, and then, you know, the Cornet has, a, has an ability to sort of help with the assessment of study feasibility and, 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 and which data resource is going to be the most appropriate to close that gap, whether it's health plan or uh, electronic medical record or a combination of both. Um, and then there's also the, the PCORnet ability to sort of designate a study as um, uh, passing the rigors of uh, the PCORI methodology report, which if you haven't seen that out on PCORI's website, it's a great resource to sort of have for how to how to conduct either large pragmatic trials or um, also uh, observational research. Um, so where where is PCORinet right now? Well, they've they've tested their uh, their systems functionality, and there's there's 14 ongoing. Actually, I think there's more now demonstration studies. Uh, that are really focused on some critical research questions that have two focuses. So one is to actually answer a question that's of clinical interest that either came out of clinician stakeholders or patient stakeholders, but also to showcase the the, the infrastructure and the and the value to address uh, ultimately other questions. I'm going to talk about uh, two domains or three demonstration projects today, two observational and, and one interventional. Uh, but there are a lot of other things going on, and there's a lot more to learn about the Cornet demonstration projects out on, on their website. So I, I promised the, the sort of story of, of my kids and sort of where I see Pacornet uh, being sustainable. And so, um, you know, so my kids are in CHOP right now. So they are data points within PEDSnet. Uh, if they had Anthem insurance, they would be data points within Anthem. Uh, maybe we move down here and they become Nemours patients. So I would love to be able to, to track this data, right, to, to really close this gap. Um, maybe we'll move out to Ohio. That would be a nationwide. Uh, maybe Luke here will go to, uh, to Duke and, and, and Evan will go to NYU, right? So they'll be part of uh, Mid-South and they'll be part of uh, uh, New York City CDRM. Maybe they go to grad school in uh, Chicago and be part of the Capricorn Network. Where am I going with this? Ultimately, they are going to traverse multiple health systems across their lifetime and multiple health plans across their lifetime. And if you want to answer the question today, what effect does the first two years of antibiotics in your first two years of life have on, let's say, colorectal cancer? You cannot answer that question, not observationally and not RCT, right? They're not going to go, I'm not going to give you an antibiotic. I'm going to enroll you in a trial. I'm going to follow you for the next 50, 80 years, right? That's not going to happen, right? So currently, PCORnet needs to survive 
long enough for my grandchildren to study my son's data to answer that question, right? All right, so that's, that's the pie in the sky. That's the lifetime problem. Um, hopefully these two guys are smarter than dad to figure that out. Uh, but my antibiotics and vaccine coverage and stuff is in a closed pediatrician's office in Bud Lake, New Jersey. I don't know where your longitudinal data uh, resides. With that said, let's get concrete and show something, some gap that, that uh, Picornet is addressing. So I'm a pharmacist. Uh, I used to moonlight at CVS, and I have grappled with this aspirin question. Patient comes into the pharmacy. Doc told me to start an aspirin regimen. What dose should I take? I don't know. You flip a coin. You want to bleed or do you want to be covered, right? Risk benefit. I don't know. I'm not really sure how the answer is, right? So this was an actionable research question that had an ability to address a couple of things, right? Because aspirin therapy is not well captured in anybody's information management, right? It doesn't generate claims because it's an over-the-counter product. So it really does rely on a lot of patient self-report. Um, also may not be well captured in, in electronic medical record uh, data as well. Um, so this, this created a, a nice equipoise question uh, to, to address, and so that's the, the nature of this study. Um, here, here we are in the, I think this is Rite Aid, Gary, that I could tell based on the, um, uh, the counter. Um, but 19,000 deaths or heart attacks, or thousands of bleeds annually in the United States, right? So this has real life implications for health systems and payers and patients and providers. So. Uh, a really important question uh, to, to answer. But you want to be efficient about this. Uh, and so what the adaptable team is, has developed, and they've engaged uh, a lot of patients, uh, and they call them adapters, in the design and, and follow-up and, and conduct of this study. Uh, to date, they've enrolled 6,000 patients. Um, they have downgraded the, the number of enrollees from the 20,000 to, to 15,000. Um, but through an online portal system, uh, low touch over these defined time points, no office visits, uh, collect this information uh, from patients and integrate that with data that's already being collected, common data model, data that is already at um, health systems, um, and now longitudinal claims from uh, health plans and or CMS if they are enrolled in, in, in Medicare fee-for-service. Um, so for example, if you have a heart attack and you don't come back to uh, Christiana, the CDM or the common data model of that health system wouldn't know about that. So that's the value add of, of the, the health plan. So this is an example of, of the portal. Um, they, they get to watch a video, uh, read more about it, answer questions, so very interactive consenting process. Um, but low touch from the point of you don't need a, a clinical research associate sitting in the waiting room enrolling these patients. So I've already started to hint at sort of the, the differences then between the traditional trial approach and, and what's being leveraged here in the pragmatic space within adaptable. Um, very rapid ability to identify inclusion and exclusion <laughs> criteria. Uh, it took us about a week and a half to find all of the patients. Once we have the data in the common data model, we run this computable phenotype code that uh, identifies the population that, that's potentially eligible. Um, the, a pragmatic study being, being opened up to being a more broad patient community. Uh, the consent, as I already mentioned, has some patient-directed um, adapters contributed to the consent development. Uh, the, the online portal has uh, patients talking and walking other patients through the consenting process. Um, data collection is, is now taken out of the site and, and centralized into that, into that data mart or that, that local health system that has their data already being collected in a common data model. Um, so it, it removes some of the, uh, the, the need for deep on-site activities. Um, endpoint adjudication, instead of having to uh, uh, medical record review everything, um, you're able to utilize the electronic data that, that, that's already collected. So I've, I've been hinting at where, where administrative claims fills a gap in the data collection process of large pragmatic uh, clinical trials. And so, um, you know, we've really entered into this, into this focus of, of leveraging our administrative claims to support this. And when we were first approached, 
um, by PCORnet to participate, it was to, to support patients who were enrolled by CDRN. Um, but actually enrollment in, in our overlap was very low. So New York City and California, which are two big states for us, they were not enrolling a lot of patients. So we were not going to provide a lot of support. Um, and additional challenges is that because we were not engaged up front, their consenting process did not include language that our legal team was sufficient to allow this release, right? Nothing would get a health plan ticked off faster than if a patient calls member services and said, you gave my data to who for what, right? So it's not just informed consent about the risks of research. You also need to inform the patients about and get their authorization for that, that said disclosure, those types of things. Um, so we've gone back, we've been working with the team to, uh, to get a supplemental consent. Uh, and so they're, they're starting to roll that out to get those authorizations um, uh, uh, from that perspective. Meanwhile, over the last year, we turned this thing on its head and said, well, we could be a recruiting site. And we could recruit patients from outside CDRN get a little bit more real world outside of some of these academic medical centers to really deep into um, the, the healthcare delivery system and enroll patients directly. And so uh, we've done that and I'll, I'll highlight some of that uh, in a moment. So here are where the, the data sites um, are. So New York City, uh, some down in California, Vanderbilt is the number one enrolling site uh, right now. Duke is obviously also uh, the number two enrolling site. Um, and patients are coming from these sites being recruited in clinics. Um, and obviously, in being recruited by your provider, there's a higher conversion rate. Ours is a low-touch mass mailing, um, but we sort of get what we get. So here is the study design. Uh, I already mentioned you can identify this uh, population either through EHR data or administrative claims. And in some cases, administrative claims while we don't have things like smoking status and some of these additional enrichment factors, we do potentially have a broader access to measure the heart attacks and, and, and cabbages and PCI procedures that they have had in the past because we can see that across health systems. Uh, patients are then contacted, randomized to 81 milligrams or 325. Um, it's not new start patients, so um, patients who are on existing therapy who do want to randomize uh, can be randomized to uh, one of these two doses, and then they're followed for every three or four months. That's also randomized. Um, and then there's a duration of 24-month of follow-up. With these primary endpoints that you can see are ripe for data collection through automated processes, right? Hospitalizations create a trail of data. We don't have to bring the patient back every month and say, we're in the hospital, we're in the hospital, we're in the hospital. Um, I already mentioned a little bit about some, some endpoint uh, ascertainment. So um, patients may self-report hospitalizations, uh, and that would lead to, to some adjudication. But also there are the event algorithms that will be run uh, within EHR systems, as well as supplemental linkages with um, Medicare claims, as well as uh, private health plan data, such as ourselves, for, again, authorized um, members. So here we are, uh, 115. Uh, I already checked this morning, we've got another 11, uh, even over this. We're at the top of the list, but this was over a two month period of time. We started in November um, and we messaged, I have the, the numbers on the, on the next slide. Uh, we messaged about 30,000 providers about the project, told them that we would be outreaching to their members, giving them a, an option to opt out. We had very little uh, opt out from, from providers. That occurred in, in October. Uh, and then in November, uh, we started to enroll patients. And, you know, this is really exciting for a health plan to engage membership into a pragmatic trial. Um, I, I have access to the portal. I remember the morning I was like hit and reload on the, on the thing. And, you know, boom, we see people, in, you can see them enter the portal and then consent, you know, because a couple minutes later, 20 minutes later, they, they, they finish. Um, so our, our enrollment is, uh, is great, but when I show you the numbers to get to this, you'll go, ooh, maybe not efficient. Um, but remember, this is demonstration proof of concept uh, uh, type of stuff. So we, we actually had 1 million patients that um, met the computable phenotype, but then we limited and excluded the patients that just had a history of coronary artery disease because we really wanted to make sure that we were outreaching pa to patients that were eligible. 
right? Nothing would be worse than sending something to a member, hey, you're interested in this trial and they're really not eligible. So we refined the, 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 the algorithm a little bit to say only in the cases where we have seen the myocardial infarction cabbage or, or PCI. Um, and so that got us to uh, 590,000. Uh, lots of other exclusions with regards to not no longer currently active uh, um, uh, in, in, in plans or benefit designs that preclude us from doing research and, and those types of things. We, we landed at, and then um, do not contact lists that, that we got from Anthem and whatnot. Uh, but we arrived at a, at a, at a list of 133,000 members uh, and we've now done two waves of uh, email or mail outreach. Uh, to these members. We've had about 800 people uh, who have come to the portal and, and we've, we're now up to, to 208 uh, as of this morning that have in, enrolled in the trial. So about a 26% conversion rate for those who touch the portal stick with us and, and ultimately enroll. Um, and that's actually consistent with other uh, CDRN sites that are doing the same type of outreach like John Hopkins and Temple where they're doing uh, mail outreach for their members. Um, Vanderbilt and Duke and some of the other sites are doing enrollment where a, uh, a window pops up in Epic that the patient is eligible. Um, they have a, about a 50% conversion rate uh, where the patient then, you know, starts the portal and, and completes to at least enrollment. So that, that's adaptable in a nutshell. I can take some questions yeah, on it. So the patient's going here. I'm not part of CRN. No, so they're not, and that's the thing. So we've got um, we've got patients coming from cardiology associates of fill in the blank from from really all over the country. Um, I actually was looking in the in the database today of the the 208. You know, we actually are enrolling some patients who their primary provider or their cardiologist provider is actually from one of the CDRS. So we've enrolled some patients from Ohio State. Ohio State is just now onboarding as a recruitment site. Um, but we got to them and we issued the letter to them and, and they got excited about the research based on our outreach. But I thought that the CDRN, unrolling from the CDRN was an advantage to get the data from the heads. Correct. Actually, I, I, I think our data is as, for a study like this, I think our data is as rich, if not richer, than the CDRN data. Remember, the outcomes are hospitalization for things that are easily billable and measured, right? Um, if the outcome was uh, weight, and I'll get to that in just a second because it's going to dovetail into the observational study, then no, I would not be a good partner. You know, if it was a weight loss study, you know, does aspirin reduce weight gain or something? I mean, I, let's be crazy here for a minute. No, don't use me. I'm, I'm not going to be helpful. Um, but in many, in many respects, I may be able to identify outcomes across health systems. And of course, our consent has the baked in language right away that we can, we can use your claims and, and, uh, and now that you've enrolled, we can turn those claims over to, to Duke for, for analysis. Um, yeah. How have your uh, month follow-up numbers? <laughs> yeah, great question. So one of our uh, conditions we, we stipulated that we were going to be a recruitment site not doing the heavy lift of the enrollment, because you're right, um, you know, a, a, a CDRN may have a little bit more relationship to sort of pick up the phone, hi, I'm from University of fill in the blank, I, you've enrolled in this clinical trial, I need you to come back. Um, we're actually getting good people to give us that third, that, that, th so there's an early check-in visit. We haven't gotten to three months yet, but there's an early check-in visit at two weeks. And that's where they give us contact information, phone number, and that type of stuff. They give us email when they log in, but we don't get phone number until that early check-in. We've got about 20 people that have been a month or more without, with missing that um, two-week early check-in visit. So that's 20 out of 200, although not all 200 have gotten to the point where they've gotten the, the message. So I would say 15% are missing their early check-in. The early check-in this week. It's, it's, it's a two-week early check-in to say, hey, thanks for enrolling in the study. We need to collect a little bit more information because it was too burdensome to have it all in that one. And you want to keep that engagement early on so that three months from now, people go, oh, yeah, that was that thing that I did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and that's going on right now. And what we have permission from them to do is we are, we actually just did this yesterday. We uploaded the file of phone numbers to Duke and Duke is now starting to make phone calls to get those people back. They've signed consent, so they're in. Now it's the, the tender loving care, as you say, of, of keeping people engaged. But they are not seen by a physician. No, they're not seen by any physician. That's what makes this cheap. The IRB issues them. Federal IRB, local IRB, around. Uh, great, great question. So uh, they toyed with the idea of using a central IRB, but a lot, got a lot of pushback from the CDRNs so long before we were engaged. Um, but we we are using, um, we have this IRB approved through actually one of the same IRBs that approved it for New York City. So they were already familiar with the project. We do have a phone number um, that, that members can outreach to, uh, both us and, uh, and Duke. I've talked to a lot of patients, uh, not all 800. Um, many people can figure this out, run through it. Um, but, uh, but we are available and we do have that, that capability within our site to, to help with recruitment. Once they are enrolled, they're on to Duke and Duke has that infrastructure. And so there's a Duke IRB and there's a site IRB. But your, your point's valid, the IRB, um, uh, concerns um, were, were a challenge. I spent most of the year on that. But we're, we're getting there. And I think with some of the changes to the common rule and some of the other things that are coming, um, and, and, and Picornet is, is promulgating what's called smart IRB as a, as a new central IRB that, uh, that many sites will, will cede to. Um, but we didn't have any trouble with it because we, we, uh, we have to pay to use our IRB anyway. We use a couple different IRBs when we need them. Appearance to dosage by self-report. By self-report, okay. yeah. So this actually, and the IRB thing leads into, if you thought um, uh, pragmatic trials were a challenge, where do you get to observational world, right? Um, so what's nice about the adaptable study is that somebody has a relationship with the patient, albeit a very arm's distant relationship with the patient. We were able to mail them. And once they offer up authorization, then we have that signed document that allows us to do what we need to do, right? But how many people here have written an observational protocol that said, the only risk to the patient is loss of confidentiality. All data will be stored on secure servers behind two locked doors, right? <laughs> and your IRB goes, waiver of authorization, right? You're blessed, right? Well, now imagine that you live in the world where you go, yeah, but you know what? They might go to CHOP. And wow, yeah, I'm going to need to link data. Uh, I'm going to need to send some identifiers to CHOP. Wait a minute, that's going to put the patient at risk. I like that now, right? So this is now enter the space of observational research. And we were tasked in our program funding announcement as we joined PCORnet to support um, these two observational studies. One was bariatric, a bariatric surgery study and one was a, a, a childhood obesity study looking at antibiotics in the first two years of life and weight gain at five and 10. So back to my example that I can help with the exposure, but I can't help with the outcome. But a health system like Nemours may not have all of the exposure, right? They only have prescriptions written, number one. They don't have dispensings, although if you're spending the time demanding an antibiotic at a pediatrician's office, you're probably going to fill it, so I respect that but they don't have the antibiotics that are written outside of the health system, right? So you have classic exposure misclassification, right? Um, so as a reviewer, journal reviewer, I am totally fine when you say that uh, you can't measure some covariates well, right? Because you can do a sensitivity analysis to sort of assess the impact. But if you can't measure your exposure and you can't measure your outcome well, right? A lot more work needs to be done. Bariatric study was looking at um, one, three, and five year benefits and risks, some resurgeries and those types of things, and rehospitalizations or hospitalizations outside. Um, again, uh, when I read studies that say our primary outcome was 30 day readmission, and then I get to the limitation section that says, but I only know if they came back to my health system. I'm like, hey, that's your primary outcome, right? So that's where health plan data can help close that longitudinal gap, right? But you need the permissions to be able to link the data. And so 
We're now in the space of how do we support this? We're, we're uh, exploring modalities in, uh, in um, anonymous linkage and, and de-identification of, of data, DID. All right, so I'll, I'll skip some of these. I, I mentioned the, the antibiotic study. Cornet also has cross-network collaborations across a host of domains. Um, and then I, I just wanted to finish up uh, with the introduction of, of PCRF, or the People-Centered Research Foundation. So PCORNET ends, all these contracts for these CDRNs end in September, October timeframe. And so this is PCORNET 2.0. Uh, only those network sites that are part of PCORNET now can apply um, to, to be part of this People-Centered Research Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> there's an inaugural board um, chaired by Rob Califf, uh, formerly at the FDA, now back at Duke, um, and a, a large board, largely born out of the relationships with Cornet. Very similar mission uh, and vision, and really seeking to leverage what this Picornet 2.0 is going to look like. So the funding runs out. Their predominant funding is from um, the Cornet, but their first order of business is to begin to find what are the sustainable business models to to sustain a foundation like this. Um, the five themes are very similar to the themes of PCORNET, uh, uh, really reducing administrative simplicity and efficiency, the people-centeredness, um, culture, and high impact. This will look familiar because it's kind of the whole leveraging this common data model approach, uh, but now spending a lot more time on um, electronic health data integration, so EHR, PRO, and really you could put another box on here, uh, claims data. So I'll end with where is your health data? <coughs> a lot of it is in the EHR systems. A lot of it is in the outpatient systems. A bunch of it is in health plan data over a lifetime. Uh, some of it's out, prescription, cash paid prescriptions. Don't get me started on opioids. People who pay cash for them, I can't see them, so I'm not good at doing opioid work, right? But if I could link to the state PDMP, whoa, I, much better resource because I could, number one, see how complete the PDMP is, look across state lines, and Anthem is doing care management in the opioid space but can't look at PDMP, but a practicing provider can look at an individual patient's PDMP today. So we have care management on the health system side. We have care management on the health plan side. And neither of the two are talking, but wasting resources, right? All right, I'll step off my opioid <laughs> soapbox for a second. We have public health clinics. We have patient-reported data that all lie outside of, of some of these networks. Although things are starting, I think these circles are starting to come together. Uh, of course, OTC meds and others. So I, I invite people to check PCORNET out. Um, PCORNET will morph into this PCRF. Uh, space. Uh, the front door is a is a place to knock uh, with really interesting research ideas and questions uh, and potentially form partnership for, for future grant uh, applications or association applications or um, uh, funding sources. With that, I'll take some questions. I know we... Because you said that each each parent was uh, the ownership of their data, obviously. So if someone wants uh, you know, to do a specific study and would like to get a, a data set from all over the country from all these CDRNs, how does it work? I mean, are, are the data merged in some ways and then sent to the researcher? Or? Right. So um, let, let me get under the hood of that front door a, a little bit more. Um, and I also like to open up sometimes the kitchen door, because if, if all you really need is some health plan data, well, then you might go health plan. If all you really need is pediatric data, you might just go to PedsNet. So I want to make sure that the kitchen door is sort of always, always an option. Um, but basically, the data is not centralized. That's one of the strengths. That's what, and, and even within a CDRN, the data is not centralized. Okay, so for example, PedsNet is eight pediatric hospitals. All of them have their data all over the place. And then they have a coordinating center. So if, if a question comes to them 
the CDRN has to make the decision to participate in it and make that query available to the other sites. They would aggregate their data, come to the PEDSnet CDRN, and be aggregated back up. It's not a, uh, you can't just go and go, okay, I want all the data on all the sickle cell patients in the country, burn a CD and mail it to me. So you have to be very focused on how to frame the question so that because the data that will come back will be uh, aggregated across sites. What, what, what do you mean by aggregated? Just a so we had patient, patient level. Well, so patient level is then what opens up the Pandora's box of privacy concern. Um, there is a mechanism to do that through de-identification. And so there is work, but not all sites are ready to participate in that. Um, what I mean by aggregate level data is, and we do this in Sentinel all the time, right, is we get massive numbers of the number of people exposed to, let's just take Vioxx and myocardial infarction as an example. You would, the, the Harvard Pilgrim Coordinating Center would distribute to all of us how many people between the ages of zero and one, two to five, five to 10, 45 to 55, whatever, are exposed to Vioxx. And you get, you get numbers, right? How many of those then had an outcome? of myocardial infarction following start. So you do get very small numbers, but it's still aggregated up such that the data that is shared back to the coordinating center is aggregate, not individual level. But it was aggregated exactly the same way across all 18 data points. Um, Dirty little secret, Stata. I see the Stata lanyard. If you type expand N, you'd get back to a one row per patient data set in theory, right? But that is the ultimate privacy preserving, right? You don't need to know that there was a, uh, you don't need the level of detail of a individual level data to get research done. Well, of course, it depends on the question. Yes. But for prep to research type stuff, figuring out who you would want to partner with, you want to keep it as low touch as possible. That's going to improve efficiency. Because if you went to, so think about this, each of these data marts, each of these CDRNs are made up of, on average, about seven or eight health systems. So the number of data marts that sit behind this there's, I, I forget what the number is. I think it's um, over 80 data marks. Um, so to call each of them up individually and say, I need an individual level data set, that wouldn't be the first place to start anyway. So the front door is a place to say, who should I work with? And are there local investigators that are also interested in my, in my research topic, right? So that I can engage them not just in the data, right? Because I don't think you would be, as a Christiana organization, be happy if somebody in the middle of, in, at Penn State Hershey said, give me your individual level data on fill in the blank, right? Hmm, wait a minute, for what? Why? You know what I mean? So a lot of what this is is, is formating and collating those relationships to improve the abilities to do this. And step one is don't need your individual level data. Now work backward. What do I need that can get me? Oh, we built a relationship. Hey, you want to answer this question? Now you built a relationship. So that's why it's more than just the data, right? Collaborative nature. So the front door is the place to start. That's going to open the door, right? And usually it's, well, how much do you have? And that's, you know, half the, like when the phone rings and somebody says, I want to do a collaboration, it's like, how many RA patients do you have? How many JIA patients do you have? Now I got a desktop tool and I can quickly query that, right? The next sentence is not, oh, and here it is, I'll ship it to you, right? No, legal would not be happy on that, right? But you could foresee that you would then down to investigators and add to the institution, <coughs> put together data you know, Yes. Create, I mean, it's the beginning of, yeah. but it's not uh, searchable. 
integrated data network where I can have the nope. myself. Right. Well, um, no, but I think you have to be. My exposure, my covariance, my outcome. Right. I can all of that where I, unless I get the de-identified data. But you know what? A lot of the modeling now can also be done automated. We do that in Sentinel all the time. High dimensional propensity scores, done not a problem. Data stays at the data part. So I can write code? And Sentinel does. I mean, this, the coordinating center would do that, not you. Oh. I mean, there I are people like there. The, or I would collaborate with coordinating Absolutely. Center. Yes. Say, oh, coordinating. Yes. They could do that and tap into all the data. Through distribution. You have to keep thinking about for the same reason that I don't want to send my data somewhere, everybody else doesn't want to send their data either. So that changes the paradigm of thinking, right? So you say, okay, I don't need all of the data. Hmm, maybe I do this as, uh, all right, I write the code, everybody, everybody's model runs, uh, the models converge, and then I get back this limited data set, or this not even limited data set, this aggregated level data set that says, the number of patients that you had in this propensity score bucket was this. So everything is now aggregated numbers. And you could assess the heterogeneity of treatment effect across sites. Uh, you could set it up as a meta-analysis if you wanted to do that and say, you know. But the idea is to keep those relationships, right, intact. So, that, so here's, here's the issue. Companies like IMS and Truven that have big data aggregation, right? They're great because if you buy that, you just sit at your desk and you do it. That's great. Can't validate. Can't go then and go and go, okay, well, which providers are these so I can enroll them? Not identifiable. So strength, big data. Weakness, what can I do with it? Same thing here with the CDRNs, right? Do you want it all aggregated? Well, that already exists. That's sort of IMS Truven. That doesn't answer the question of patient engagement, clinician engagement, research engagement, and ultimately enrollment in pragmatic trials and all of that type of stuff. So that's that trade-off, right? So the trade-off then is, ah, all right, you keep your data just like I keep my data, but now we can collaborate way more efficiently because I can give you code either through the coordinating center or even directly if you figure it out. You know, Sentinel has a, a tool called Cohort Identification and Descriptive Analysis. Sounds like something we do all day long, right? You have a database of 12 million people. You don't care about 12 million people, right? You need it, the 1 million people that you care about, right? Or you need the 100,000 or you need the 10,000 people you care about, right? And then you want to do some descriptive statistics on it. Just basic table one type stuff, right? <clears throat> Get an assessment. Uh, of exposure and do simple table one stuff, right? That's usually step one of 90% of our research, right? You don't really need the individual level data to do that. If you trust the code and you trust the organization, put the data in the common data model correctly, right? I think I'm tired as a taxpayer of paying everybody to go out and buy Medicare data and download it and do all sorts of different things, right? It's terrible. You probably have some Medicare data. Penn has six people have Medicare data. Duke has 13 people, all these people, right? Spend in tax dollars from NIH and AHRQ and everything else to go get ResDAC data to bring it down and clean it up, right? Wouldn't it be great if it was just in a common data model? You submitted code to it. Cut a lot of the governance, right? Cut a lot of the privacy stuff out of having that that resource. So is there, is there a way to have been, oh, Medicare is in there. Uh, Duke, Duke has the Medicare data in the virtual data warehouse in the common data model. So that there's a move to that. That, that dream's becoming a reality. So that would be another reason to knock on the front door and say, I want to run this query in Medicare, in the Medicare common data model. Um, because I think it'll be efficient. Now, what do you lose in the common data model? Well, not every single variable is going to be in there. And I always say, you know, people, people use the term variable. And you know, is there a variable for CHF in there? No. Is there diagnosis variable? Yes, that's a database variable. And you create an analytic variable called CHF. I hate the term variable. Okay. Database variable? 
for analytic variables, right? Something I created or something that was sort of automatically collected, right? Age, age is a variable that drives me nuts. Age should always be age underscore something because don't give me age. I don't want age. Age at index, age at baseline, age at moment, age at diagnosis, age at something. Does that make sense? And you don't want dates of birth. Believe me, you don't want dates of birth. Then you get breached. Oh boy. Now it's a big problem. So, that's a question. <laughs> uh, the comment that I have is do you have, did publish? Yeah. Picornet.org. Um, under research, second one down is CDM. I don't know if we're connected to the internet, it could probably pop out uh, yeah, we can find to show it. Um, but it's all out there, and, it, and the other place to go is the Sentinel website, sentinelsystem.org, just to see their common data model. You strain your eyes, you're looking at the same thing, except that. The variables yeah. are all defined. And right, they're all defined. They're all defined. And it's all it all runs in SAS, much to my chagrin. I'm a data guy myself. Um, so I, I mean it's it's all it's all there. Um, uh, oh. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> Interpretive dance time. Um, the, the tables the, the, here are the tables. In, that are common in both Cornet and sex. Demographic, um, sex needs to be called sex, not sex underscore something, right? It, just, it has to be named that way or nothing will work, right? It has to take the values of M and F, and you would actually, the Cornet is a bit more expansive for other reasons. Um, you know, how many of us have gotten a really crappy Excel spreadsheet from a fellow beforehand? <laughs> Started collecting it in M's and F's and then zeros and ones and then ones and twos and no data dictionary and none of that, right? No. Highly standardized. It's called PAD ID. Not study ID, not PID, not ID, not it's this, right? It's this or nothing to work, right? Demographic table, one row per patient, that information. Things that don't change. Although they have marital status. That stuff drives me nuts. Right? Because it does change. <laughs> Next thing, enrollment. We can populate a good enrollment table. How do health systems populate enrollment table? First time I saw you, last time I saw you. Best I got. Right? Enrollment, start, end. Maybe there's some, hey, you were gone for a year, restart. You're allowed to have multiple rows in there, right? We have people that leave us and come back. So, diagnosis. Um, pad ID, encounter ID, code, code type. Code type takes the values of DX9 or DX10, I think. Um, uh, zip code is in enrollment, I think. If not, it's in demographic and would drive me nuts too, but yes, zip code is in there. But talk to a health plan about aggregating at the zip code level, and we're going to be a little bit skittish, right? Because hmm, who might get their hands on this data and find out, oh, look, Anthem has a big deep density in, right? And you should too, right? Or Nemours would, right? How, how awesome do you think Nemours is at sharing its individual level data with CHA? <laughs> what do you think, what governance do you think had to get in, put in place there, right? The zip code in Chad's Ford would be really relevant, right? You drive up 95 and they say, you missed us. You drive down 95. Here, right? Um, so the, is that starting to make sense why the premise is to keep the data where it where it was? Because it's, I know, both are nonprofit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's definitely competition, right? Uh, there's some demonstration projects going on on quality. Talk about another fearful place, right? I put quality metrics on your data, and now I get to learn and go, oh, you know what? Temple is better than Christian at fill in the blank, right? That's really competitive information. Another reason to keep the data where it is so that people make informed decisions about participating in trials. Say, yeah, that one's not for me. I want to participate in it. Um, 
dispensing, prescribing, laboratory, vitals, death, cause of death, we can't populate. But we have good death data because if you die in the hospital, that's a discharge status, you know about it. You don't know if somebody dies outside of Christianity. Like your death data would be very in incomplete, but if they died, you're probably better at populating causes. So trade-offs. Um, you go skiing and have a heart attack at Vail, you're, nobody knows, right? We would, because we'd pay for it, <laughs> in theory. Okay. Thank you.